Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new season of MyCast, MyCast's official podcast. This is your host Pallavi and this is your host Kasturi. This season's theme is the Media Masters where we take a deep dive into the ever evolving world of media and entertainment, seeking out stories, insights and behind the scenes processes for you to hear. Today we will be discussing the Indian film industry and the business of cinema. We are delighted to have Ms. Ridhima Lilla, Chief Content Officer at Eros International with us today on this episode of the Media Masters. Thank you so much for joining us today, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you both and glad to be a part of this. So, let's dive right in. You have been directly or indirectly involved with films since childhood, and while many things have changed in the industry like the way films are made, the consumption pattern, etc., what's one thing that you feel hasn't changed? So I think the media industry of course has naturally continued to evolve over time whether it's through the way we make films whether it's through the way we consume them as you said but I think the one thing that really hasn't changed and will never change is people's um demand for to be entertained I think entertainment is something that just lies so uh deep beneath our culture and it's something that has always been a part of like you know the way we live i mean everyone when they want to go out when they want to do something for you know pleasure it's always evol- evolving around sort of the entertainment industry or sports right in some way or something spiritual so i think entertainment is a really really large part of that and that's just something the demand for will never ever change it's really interesting that you mentioned that it's a part of our culture like i really yeah. agree like bollywood culture it is like it's part of our blood almost and we're very yes. enthusiastic about it it's very interesting that you bring that up that that passion hasn't really changed no matter yeah. whether you look at it 30 years ago or now yeah it's true which is actually pretty interesting because that leads us to our next question that talking about redefining entertainment in the last 2 years we've seen that ott platforms especially after the pandemic have completely changed people view or access entertainments and the supply and demand for movies are at home are at an all time high still so yeah. in such a competitive scenario how do you put your finger on the right kind of stories that would strike a chord with the audience it's a very loaded question and i don't think there's any like sort of right or wrong answer to it but um i i'll do my best i think that um a couple of factors come into play i think one is obviously experience um another is data and um gut feeling which is i guess an extension of experience in some way um i i think that you know as a team i try and keep the team very motivated to constantly be on the hunt for new stories in many different ways whether it's stuff that is really cu- culturally influential like capturing like the current zeitgeist or if it's something that's going into more of like historicals historicals that could be like relevant for society today i mean i think one interesting genre we like to play with is taking stuff from history and making sure that it's relevant for people who haven't actually heard of it ever before you know making stuff that was completely unknown seen in a really current way also looking for literature i think always being on the hunt for like the latest book or perhaps like books that you know have existed for ages but people have just never known about like i think um like harshad mehta story for scam obviously it's a, it's a really famous story based on harshad mehta and his life and everything but the book came mad in like what 92 93 something along those lines but no one like picked it up that exact book for ages and i remember like i think it was 5 6 years ago or something we we were actually in the hunt for for that book and looking for the rights for anything that really covered that story so you know I, I you mentioned actually in your comment earlier or, or th- that I read that uh OTT platforms may not have picked up a show like that but producers were like begging and dying <laughs> to pick up the book so it it it's funny how things work but I think in terms of like looking for new stories I think there really is something for everyone out there i mean we're we're a country which has over 20 languages we have over a billion people there's so many different tastes so i feel that you know there may be the stories that really hit home and are the mass telling stories but there's always a home for something that's a bit more experimental too it's really interesting that you mentioned scam because we actually had a question kind of about around that is yeah. that you know um what do you think really dominates this industry is it profitability or is it content itself because again as a person from a business domain you will have some experience in balancing those two things you can't really give up on either of those and yeah. you know for example with scam as well it took a while for that show to be pitched and then get approved because not everyone was sure people would resonate with that storyline so where do you fall on that balance 
true so i think that it has to be a combination and a balance of both like one can't exist without the other they both kind of complement each other so i think you can't can't new content can't exist without the notion of profitability i mean this industry is only thriving because of the profitability right that it attracts then you know it builds and people contribute and make more content but i think that you know everyone has to sort of do their job in the chain of things like me in the position that I sit as chief content officer of the group I have to look at both completely I mean when I first started I was looking mostly just at the content aspect but when you grow you have to realize that you know this has to be financially viable at the end of the day we are running a business here and what good is me doing i'm not doing my job if i'm not having something that's profitable because i won't be able to support new filmmakers support growth in my industry which is which is really what we want to do as a community right like new stories can only be told by like a different set of people you can't have like the same set of people telling the same stories all the time so to to answer your question i mean it's a very difficult balance that you have to strike and like for example when we plan our slate like if i know um for our series if i'll have something that are like eight shows that are like sure shot winners that i know i mean there's never a such thing as such thing as a sure thing but you can only try so if i know that i have eight things that are in that category which i i i know people will be attracted to and i can balance it with like maybe three things four things that you know are a bit risky a bit um you know experimental because you'll never have growth either if you don't experiment so it has to be a combination of both and like allocating the correct budget like making making that show or making that film in the correct budget um and you know if if that genre or if that story does well as a space you know then you know next time that's that's an audience that you've grown uh and you can contribute more of your budget um to that so I mean I hope that answers your question but it, it's a bit of a tricky balance that one has to continuously try to strike yeah it definitely does i think your point about the budget is very interesting because we would have never thought about that allocating yeah. a reasonable budget to a project that you're not sure will fly won't fly is a pretty wise decision like yeah. when we for example pitch our ideas in a classroom or when we are working on ideas the budget kind of comes last and we kind of get carried away by the emotion of what's the story we want to tell but yeah. having that consideration knowing that you need to sustain growth if you were say in an organization where you're working like this yeah. i think that's a very important point i think it's a good key learning for us to keep in mind having a reasonable budget is a good idea <laughs> always always <laughs> like you just mentioned that there is a very fine line between the creativity and the budget and you have to walk that line carefully without going overboard on either side so eros being an age old player has been walking that line for years and years now being one of the top production houses very recently it has ventured into the ott space so what is eros's strategy right now given that there are already so many ott giants in the indian market well i mean i think there's a variety of things and uh, like i said like every platform has like a speciality like you go to a netflix you go to an amazon because they give you something specific right they have those specific shows that you keep coming back for um so i think as an as it was now you know our strategy is a little different we're we're not a netflix we're not an amazon we're not an international platform we're a homegrown indian based platform and i think our strategy has always been to get like our homegrown customers in and the indian diaspora is so large that that's expanded so much you know like it's not just restricted to our subscribers in india but you know we have such a large outreach globally too but it's all based on having that indian strong content so like you know we've been in the business for like nearly 50 years 50 plus years now and i think that from cinema is where our content base and our audience has really drawn in like being entertained on a mass level has been our usp always so i think that's something we've really strongly tried to bring into our eros now state but also like take a slightly maybe more experimental approach with some some like grittier shows some darker shows which are like not your family entertainers which is what we've known for so i think um putting content first is going to be like one of our key is his our key strength actually and something we're going to continue to do and like putting more shows out there because we've always we've had like strong slates in the past but i think this year we're going to be really focused on getting as many shows out there as possible like a couple of shows a month even 
uh, continuously trying to acquire more content into our library with our film premieres, the 52 film premieres that we do in a year. Um, also experimenting with technology and how that really has evolved so much in the past couple of years since COVID actually is. I think it's caused such a rapid um, growth that really we never actually you know would have expected to come so quickly. So I think those are sort of the key focuses, um, at least from my perspective for the for the content strategy that we're going to be doing. That you mentioned that Eros has been in business for over 50 years, which is an incredible amount of time. You've seen the industry shift, or at least this business has seen the industry shift quite a bit. And you've also been in the industry for quite a long time. So what would you say has been one of your most challenging projects that you'd like to tell us about? And how did you kind of go about managing that? Um, well, each each project comes with its uh, specific set of challenges, I think. Like, um, it, I, I can definitely say that no experience has been the same for me. Uh, I think I would probably name two instances here. Uh, one would be one of the first shows that we were ever producing, uh, Smoke. I think it was like 2014. Uh, OTT platforms were not really popular at all at, at that stage. It was a very nascent stage and, um, you know, nobody was really producing shows and I was just trying to get the best talent possible to tell the story with the vision that that we had for it and you know to get the best people at that stage was actually really difficult I mean what what happened was that we got the best people for the project eventually but uh you know when when you approach talent at that stage they they just didn't believe in ott they didn't believe in series they they really thought that cinema was the only thing that was important and that these markets couldn't coexist and i think that was that was a real challenge just getting everyone on board um um, to, to really believe in this vision. And I remember, you know, A-list actors even, or B-list actors, you could say, when I spoke to them, they they were like, oh, you know, I still I still want my film. I, I'm really not interested in this. And now when I look at the same actors who are like headlining shows now, it, it's just such a drastic change, you know? So that, that was a challenge, I think, um, in the beginning. And another challenge, I think, was on the film side for a film that we released recently called Hathi. Uh, it, it was a trilingual film. I think that was one of the most difficult um, things to attempt because COVID also hit uh, when we were making the film. The VFX studio had shut down in the process for, and we lost like a year nearly with that. One of the actors fell terribly sick. So it was, it was quite a challenge, like getting through that whole experience. But eventually, you know, it, it all came together really nicely and, and the film was lovely. So... Um, something that we we got through but i think every challenge is is different and i think it's exciting to have those challenges because that's part of the beauty of the journey of honestly making some of these things yeah there was a very interesting point Radhama, that you mentioned that you know previously actors who were very hesitant and you know did not want to do anything such as series of films were now keenly yeah. looking forward to it so is there something yeah. you would say has changed or what could, you know, lead to the change in the decision or the mentality that actors have around OTT space? I just think it's also the rapid growth that people, that the digital platforms have had. Like just knowing that there is so much good content out there that exists, that can coexist with cinematic content. Like eventually, I think people's patience also runs thin. Um, affordability is also a factor for a lot of people. Like why go um, perhaps to the cinema to watch something when you can, you know, subscribe to a platform and have multiple pieces of content. I think um, that has sped up so much in the past two years that people just want to experience things from home you know they don't want to have to go out and and if they are going out it's it's such a big deal and it's an outing that they only want to sort of see spectacles so like we've seen um in cinema not you know films are not like mid-sized i would say films or small films are just not doing well you know it's only like the larger spectacle films that are doing well and that too when they really have something new to offer like people have access to just so much now uh, that i think that's what's really really changed the whole process of the way talent looks at the business overall and I, and I think it's a good thing because you know films were also restricted to such a small pool of talent now it's widened and opened up so much that anyone literally anyone with a good story if if they you know you're in the right room at the right time with the right people or you get access to people or, or you just you know 
put yourself out there and do your research as best as possible. You can really put your story out there and people will support no matter your experience. I mean, as long as they feel confident and they, they invest in you and believe you can do it, it, it definitely is possible. It's interesting that you brought up research and how to like cater to, you know, audiences or even actors who might be seeking new roles. And speaking of research, we want to have a question that is a bit more future facing. Sure. And as you know, the entertainment industry gets a lot more interactive, people are speculating and hoping that, you know, movies will include stuff from augmented reality, include virtual reality, even like the entire Facebook metaverse conversation is changing the way people are perceiving entertainment. So where do you see the film industry in terms of these kind of technological advances in 10 years? It's, it's, I feel like this answer will probably change like 10 times <laughs> before 10 years even comes. But uh, that's the beauty of it. I think, um, you know, something which, which we have always adopted in our strategy and, and in our thinking is, you know, be focused on your goals. Make sure you sort of outline them and implement what you need to do right now. But always be ahead of the curve and always look at what's going to happen in like the next five or ten years. Like, I feel like that's how we got into the OTT business. That's how we try to adopt, like, you know, partner with, you know, technological partners that we have and you know maintain those relationships because we're really focused on like forward looking um for for the entertainment industry so i think what what really has brought about the change and speed about the changes is, is technology purely i think um the way we have have consumed um digital platforms uh whether it's through ar through vr i mean i think uh, VR headsets are something that's probably going to hit India pretty hard with, you know, local creators here. Uh, it's something that's quite expensive, but is going to be made inexpensive for, for India now. So I think that that's going to obviously change the way we consume content. I, I think the way we create content, um, you know, a lot of the traditional methodologies have already changed so, so much uh, with, you know, Unreal Engine, with Unity, with partners like that, uh, creating those LED screens and, and being able to shoot stuff virtually real time, or even just, you know, animatronic CGI, all of those things. I mean, that is what the forefront of the technological change of the creative industry will possibly witness. And I think it's just going to be double speed now. Um, but in terms of the way we consume, I think Theatre business, obviously, is we've seen what's happened to it in two years, so we can only imagine what would possibly happen to it in the next 10 years. Uh, we've seen like the biggest theatre companies across uh, the world that like, shut down. So I, that is going to be more of a spectacle experience, as I, as I previously said. And I think we're going to see more of... Con um, consumption of content through the metaverse probably i think that that that's what we're looking at slowly as our physical life um sort of diffuses our, our, our virtual life is going to increase it already has and it's going to continue to do that so i think we'll be focused on how our digital avatars in our virtual worlds are probably going to consume content rather than how, how we are at this stage so um i mean what where the future goes how quickly it goes who knows but i think those are sort of the directions that we're pretty much heading in yeah that was a lovely answer actually and diving into the metaverse and everything because it's all of it is very contextual because we see it happening all around but we never really think how the media landscape might change accordingly so that's yeah. a wrap on questions from our side and we'll be diving into the student question segment now so the first Great. question that we have is from Piyush Modi he asks that Eros now launched a month-long Bollywood film festival on Facebook Watch. What was the thought process, objectives, and other important touch points that had gone in and out while planning this campaign? And what was the end result? Okay, so um, I think, to be honest, we're always trying to do like cool activities with our partners, especially like Facebook, to try and you know engage them and uh i think that um what really went into this is that we have such a massive rich library and you know we release so much new content all the time that we often struggle to keep all of the content relevant right so like i think when you launch a show you're always so focused on making sure that the word of mouth making sure that you spend enough on your marketing and have cool strategies to be able to get that show out there but there is this rich library that's just 
lying there and people are not aware of it. So so an activity like that is to really get, you know, people tuned in back into, um, you know, Eros now, not just want to like dip in, watch their show and dip out and to be like, here is a rich library. Here's how you get access to it. Because, you know, when I sit and scroll and watch content on any platform, I don't have the patience to see absolutely everything. You know, I want to see what's there right in front of me. Um, and, and I feel like, technology and these platforms should be smart enough to present me that right but often that you don't have that patience to like go through maybe thousands of suggestions if there's such a big library so an activity like this is really that is the objective behind it to to make people aware of what content we have um get them to engage with it get them to sort of discuss with each other on a social platform um interact and talk about it um eventually get more users and i think the outcome was uh pretty good and i when we do such activities, we always see such a positive response and it always points us in a direction and makes us uh, more aware of, you know, films that we thought people would never even watch are like suddenly like the most consumed films on the platform. So it, it's, 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 it was pretty good for us. That's very interesting. I like the fact that you spoke about how, you know, I do think even as a consumer, I'm not very interested in the back catalog. And often, even though there's really good content there, it kind of gets lost in the rush of new content that's always coming at us. And I would say, at least knowing what Eros has done in the past 50 years, a big strength of Eros is their back catalog, some of the great films that they've already produced. And so it's a great way of kind of bringing it back to the forefront, bringing it back to people's attention. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, we have one more question from our batchmate, Gaurangi Agarwal. She asks... Before the pandemic, there was speculation about people shifting entirely to OTT. But we have seen now, especially, that things are opening up and, you know, people want to leave their homes and want to go back to theatres. So how do you think these two platforms, the digital consumption of films and the in-person theatre experience of films, can coexist? And do you think there should be a demarcation between the two? I, I don't think there ever really can be a, a demarcation between the two. I think the the lines are like, really blurred already <laughs> and they will continue to, to be so because content is content I mean uh, you create it and it has to be platform agnostic right to some point uh, but with with theatre like you know I, I think only the big budget films will do well there have been some say medium budget films maybe that have done well but you know you can look at like the past year you would say probably the A-list of star films have actually a lot of them failed at the box office which is actually you know, nobody would have imagined like a Salman Khan, a film like an anthem to do the box office figures that it possibly did. Uh, but, you know, people at home that could have so much viewership, you you just have no idea. But like a film like Pushpa did massively well. Uh, and nobody would have ever thought that, right? So that was completely unexpected. But I think good stories um, and having to actually invest in creating like a good spectacle is what will draw the theater experience and the OTT ex experience apart. We can see it with films like Spider-Man. Spider-Man is probably one of the biggest crossing films of the year. Um, it, it, it had a lot of nostalgia, it had a lot of stardom, but people wanted to go to the theater to watch that. It's not something you want to experience at home. So I think they do coexist. And I think COVID has brought about that change actually quite strongly in the past couple of years and allowed it to coexist. And I think um, this, you know, Netflix and Amazon and a platform like ours and uh, many others uh, have really given it a space to be able to have these medium budget films and experiment with those. And, you know, our stars, our strong talent to actually go to th these platforms and seek a home there, which has been really, really good as well. There's a very interesting point that you mentioned about the experiential aspect of it because I know a lot of my friends were just waiting so that they could see Spider-Man No Way Home in theatres and they just refused to watch yeah. it on an OTT platform. I was one of those people. <laughs> yeah, the theatre experience is really different. Like, I remember all of us were yeah. yelling at the screen together. Yeah, yeah. We went as groups. I think that point is interesting that they kind of have to coexist. There really isn't a way for us to choose one or the other yeah yeah for sure for sure so this is our final segment which is a rapid fire segment so we'll be asking very okay. short very interesting questions and you don't get time to think and you have to say what's the first thing that comes to your mind great so i'll start okay. so what would, okay. who would be the dream filmmaker who you would want to work with to create content for eros 
It's such a tricky question. Um, <laughs> honestly, I love John Favreau. Right now, I, I'm I'm really loving all of his work. So John Favreau. Oh, John Favreau is a good good. That's a really good answer. <laughs> I had not even thought about that. Um, oh, a recent film that you would recommend to our listeners? Okay, I have two. Um, I I recently watched. Last night in Soho, and I quite like that. I would definitely recommend that. And of course, uh, my favorite film of the year is Dune, so that's a must watch. Yes, of course. So, what, according to you, would be India's favorite genre of film? Genre of film. Um, see, I think the beauty of Indian cinema is that we pack so many different genres into one. So I would say a good drama, action, romance is is something that is super pan India. So proper Bollywood. Film. So almost like a kitchen. Yeah. yeah, like a kitchen genre. Everything is kitchen, so it has to exist. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, this is I think a tough question for you. What do you prefer, a theater or OTT? Theater for experience, OTT for convenience. Okay. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We had a great time, I think, talking to you. Well, I had a great time. Thank you so much for having me. A uh, wonderful experience. And I think it's always in- exciting and uh, great to engage with people who are really passionate and into the media industry and have a keen eye for watching like the latest trends. Uh, I would encourage discussions like these to happen more often and would love to chat with you guys more thank you for joining us on this episode of the media masters make sure to stay tuned for the next one